the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, how they tried to build an aircraft in Australia and what happened to it, tactics and strategy, night battles, and Metal Beasts, another legendary machine from the latest update. Last time, we were talking about MiG-21, and now it's time to discuss its rival from overseas that was also added in an update 1.91. Meet the third-generation fighter bomber, a two-seater called the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II. As soon as it went up in the air, it broke 15 world records concerning different performance stats. No wonder it quickly became the most mass-produced supersonic aircraft in the USA. Let's see what is so special about it. Swept wing with angled outer parts. Two extremely powerful engines from General Electric. A crew of two pilots. A radar. Uh, and of course, the armament. Uh, wait, where the hell is it? What do you mean there's none? Ah, indeed, this aircraft represents the rare case of a plane that doesn't have offensive armament. But the engineers still gave it a lot of payload options. There are gun pods with 20mm cannons, there are more than 200 unguided Mighty Mouse rockets, and about 50 more powerful Zuni missiles. There is an ample amount of bombs, the bullpups, including the newest sea modification and, of course, some air-to-air -air missiles. And how fast can it fly? Oh, fast enough. The aircraft easily speeds up and goes supersonic in no time at all, as its durable wing can survive a huge overload. The afterburner allows you to get up to 16 kilometers high and reach Mach 2 in the rarefied air. At low altitudes, the speed will be about half as fast. But that would still be enough to lose anyone trying to tail you. Now, let's talk about its cons. The armament in the gun pods is set at a small angle, so you'll need some getting used to the fact that your aiming marker is lower than the main one. Also, this aircraft won't be useful in a dogfight, and it's quite naughty when it comes to anything maneuvering out of a straight-line flight. In air battles, we recommend taking the three 20mm cannons, if you can adjust yourself to the new type of aiming, of course. And remember that this machine speeds up extremely quickly. Retract the gear immediately if you don't want to lose it right above the airstrip. In mixed RB, we begin already mid-air and at supersonic speed, which gives us an advantage against enemy AA guns. Take the bullpups. Gain about 5 kilometers of altitude and attack ground targets with your guided missiles. Bombs might be useful here as well. Use air brakes if you don't want to crash. And keep in mind that the optimal speed range for the Phantom is between 600 and 1000 kilometers per hour. This is where it will be the most responsive to your actions. When Australia started its own aviation industry in the mid-30s, nobody really took them seriously. Well, maybe Britain got a tiny bit upset that the first half-handicraft production line was going to build not a British aircraft, but an American one, the North American NA-16, the direct predecessor of the famous T-6 Texan. In any other case, the world didn't really care about Australia. But Australia did care about the world. They watched the Nazi marches all over Europe, saw Japan's imperialist ambitions, and realized that should the motor oil hit the fan, London wouldn't be able to send any help at all. So they took a completely rational approach and started with building training aircraft. 
The pilots needed to gain some experience before approaching some serious tech, but history had other plans. The first CA-1, otherwise known as the Australian NA-16, barely managed to roll off the production line in the summer of 1939 before the beginning of the war in Europe. Japan also wasn't very friendly with the West, and almost everything in Australia that was able to fly and shoot went away to protect the mother country. It's unclear whose bright head it was that came up with an idea to repurpose the CA-1 into a light bomber. But at that day and age, it was the only chance for Australia to have a battle aircraft of its own. And it worked. The idea that was regarded as an extreme measure turned out to be quite genius, really. See for yourself. A training aircraft is a simple and cheap machine that can survive an inexperienced pilot who doesn't know how to land or maneuver properly, but yet it's still capable of performing advanced flying and aerial aerobatics and moreover it's easily modified. That sounds like an ideal tactical bomber. The possibilities of the further modifications were limitless, and the Australian engineers were going to turn the CA-1 that received the name Wirraway into a dive bomber as well. But the time worked against them. On the 7th of December 1941, the Imperial fleet unleashed mayhem onto Pearl Harbor. Japanese officers, of course, were laughing at the mighty Australians, but not for long. As early as in January 1942, when the British forces were desperately trying to defend Singapore, two of the Australian Wirraways boldly bombed the attacking Japanese forces from low altitude and then turned around and arrogantly shot down a four-engine flying boat, the H-6K-4, that was coming for landing, carrying ammo and staff officers. The burning giant crashed into the waters of the Strait of Malacca in front of thousands of shocked Japanese soldiers. Starting that day, the attitude of the Japanese towards the Wiraway changed from amusement <laughs> to hatred. Not only these bombers attacked any targets imaginable, they also coordinated artillery fire. The agile Australian aircraft in the skies above the territory of New Guinea and the British Solomon Islands Protectorate was the primary target for any Japanese pilot. Even more so because a heavy flying fortress was often easier to shoot down than a maneuverable Wirraway. And we could have ended it here, but there was a follow-up to the story. A lot of countries were very impressed by the successful use of the Wiraway. So, upon joining the Allies, they were buying tons of NA-16 and T-6 Texan planes from the USA to repurpose them into the so-called Wiraway-class bombers of their own. The buyers list even included the USSR. Soviet engineers quickly recognized the potential of the Australian experience, especially because they had a Wiraway-like aircraft of their own, the Sukhoi Su-2 tactical bomber that was flying above the enemy lines from the very first days of the war. Still, Soviet pilots never got to fly the American Texans, and the Wiraway itself became outdated by the end of the war and got replaced by more powerful machines. But the Australian example turned out to be quite contagious. Even today, we can find those Wiraway-class bombers repurposed from training aircraft to fight in some local conflicts. In the previous episode, we told you the brief history of night vision devices. This time, we'll focus on a more practical approach and talk about getting prepared for a night battle and how to behave if you want to survive and be as effective as possible. First, let's figure out what tech is now adapted to fight through the night. The update 1.91 gave night vision devices to most of the high-tier tanks, helicopters, and some top-tier AA tech like ADATS and the Automatic. They come in separate modules that are obviously called NVD. You can easily check if your machine's got one by simply opening the modifications list. Icons of these devices are color-coded. The green one 
indicates that this one is based on an image intensifier, which, let us remind you, simply makes the night brighter. And the white one is the thermal sight that you can use to see heated objects. On average, the more advanced your tech is, the more progressive NVD it gets. You can spot the difference in the quality of the image. The simplest thermal sight will give you a more blurred picture compared to a modern one. Okay, we've found and installed these modules. Time to go to battle, right? Oh, wait. We also need to bind the keys. Go to Controls, Helicopter, and Miscellaneous to see two new commands. Switch NVD mode is basically an on and off button, and you'll definitely need that one. For example, we opted to bind it to N for night vision. Logical, right? The other option is right next to this one, and it's called changing the color scheme of the thermal sight. This one inverts the image to show heated objects as white against the black background or black against the white background. If you want to save some free space on your keyboard, you can easily live without this option. Then we need to do the same for ground tech. Switch to tank and then weaponry to find the night vision mode option that toggles it on and off. And next to it, IR spotlight. You can use it to additionally light up the night with a powerful infrared spotlight. Bind the desired keys, and now you're finally ready. As for the usual NVD, there isn't that much of a gameplay difference. You'll just be able to see better in the dark. Though, keep in mind that if you use your IR spotlight, every enemy with an NVD will be able to detect you. On the other hand, there is a chance that you yourself will flash the opponent's NVD and disorient him. However, when it comes to thermal sights, the difference is a lot bigger. First of all, you can use them even in broad daylight. This way, tanks get a chance to spot an enemy from any distance, and AA guns are able to see their targets even if they're hiding in the clouds. As for helicopters, a thermal sight is indeed crucial here. A target that is usually hidden under trees and bushes can now be clearly visible. But how can one escape the Great Eye? Well, there are ways, and no, we're not using any suspicious golden rings, thank you. Trees and bushes are still able to cover the heated parts of the machine. Smokes will also be very effective, at least some of them, as there are different types of smokes. For example, Smoke grenades can cast a veil that is impenetrable for any type of devices, including thermal sights and image intensifiers. But if you use an exhaust smoke system that's installed on some tanks to create a smoke cloud, that one wouldn't be a problem for thermal sight. Though you can still use it if the enemy only has the one of the simplest NVDs, and you've got something better. For him, You'll be covered by smoke, but that won't stop you from firing away as sharply as you can. And finally, you can switch your engine off. An option for that also appeared in Ground Tech Controls, under Tank, and then Miscellaneous. When your engine is off, the enemies won't be able to see the most crucial thing that can unmask you, a huge wall of hot exhaust. But remember that the engine needs time to cool down. The same goes for your weapon if you've recently fired it. It will take some time as well, and yes, sometimes the weight pays off, but don't get carried away. When the engine isn't running, your tank's battery gradually runs down. If it dies, your turret will start rotating slower, and the IR spotlight won't work at all. Moreover, while you're waiting for the hot parts to become cooler, you turn into a very tasty-looking target. In other words, you can easily fool yourself trying to ambush your enemy that way. There, that about sums up the whole topic. Time to read your comments. The first question was sent by a player called Kelly Arts. Is it possible that the non-punctured part of the tank armor is weakened for the next shot? Hi there. This effect is usually called armor fatigue, and no, it's not realized in the game. Truth be told, it's not easy to get in real life either. 
A single round won't make a lot of difference unless you hit exactly the same spot. A dozen rounds, yeah, probably they could have weakened the whole armor plate. But who would let you fire ten times in a row without consequences? Hmm? A user called Velo the Alpha DK asks, Can you make a video about thermal and how to activate it and it's working in the game? We hope that this episode answered most of your questions concerning everything night vision related. If there's still something that you'd like to know, ask away here in the comments and perhaps we'll return to this subject once again. Then there is a question sent by Loudhowler228. Please do climb in the ranks with German planes. Okay, duly noted. We'll get on making this one in the nearest future. Another question comes from Ducky Ducky. What determines the reload speeds of tanks? Well, there are many things, as usual. Overall, it's safe to say that the smaller the caliber, the easier it is for the crew to reload, even if the loader is automatic. And larger rounds would take longer to load, as they are harder to carry around. If the reload is manual, the crew's level of expertise is also very important, as well as other things like the tank's construction and the technical organization of the reloading process in general. And the last question for today was written by GT Halo 117. What rank will night vision and thermal vision be available for tankers? Hi there. You can encounter image intensifiers starting as early as Tier 3. For example, a very simple NVD is installed onto the Soviet ASU-57 tank destroyer and onto the Chinese PT-76 light tank. As for thermal sites, this technology is a lot more progressive, so it only appears on Tier 6 at BR 8.0 and higher. In the USA, one of the first to receive it is the M3 Bradley, and in Britain, it's the Warrior. Well, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. So, come on people, subscribe to the channel, cast the ring into the fire and press that bell button. Now, you gotta leave a like, and tell us what you think in the comments below. See you in a week.